studies, putting them in whatever repository they use for seasonal merchandise. And graduation and Mother's Day cards have replaced the Easter ones. Clothing ads have stopped promoting spring dresses, suits, and accessories, and have moved on to casual attire for summer. Yes, Easter is over, or so the world would have us believe. But we who are gathered here, along with our sisters and brothers, gathered in similar places around the world, know that Easter certainly isn't over. For one thing, the liturgical calendar that we follow designates seven Sundays, a week of weeks, for the Easter season to proclaim God's greatest saving act of love for us. Even the fact that we worship on Sunday commemorates the resurrection because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. We also know that Easter isn't over because every Sunday liturgy, even during Lent, is a celebration of the resurrection of our Lord, something the church has done for two millennia. And we know that Easter isn't over because as we gathered on Friday to commend Harry to God, that amid our sadness, the liturgy was full of the hope and promise of the resurrection. Unequivocally, we know that Easter is not over because Jesus, no longer bound by physical space, keeps showing up, just as he has done for 2,000 years since the resurrection. We hear him, see him, touch him, and know his presence when we share the peace of Christ with one another and in the word, water, bread, and wine of our liturgies, as well as in the quietness of our devotions, the hug of a loved one, the person who offers to help us, the friends who walk with us during the challenges of life, and in the sudden calm we sometimes feel when everything else is swirling around us. Jesus comes to meet our need, to walk with us, to bring us his peace, to sustain our faith, to give us new life. That's what today's gospel reading is all about. With the proclamations that Christ is risen, the Alleluia is the joyful hymns, the rousing anthems, the trumpets, and the beautifully decorated sanctuaries of our Easter celebrations, it's easy to forget the emotional turmoil and confusion even despair these disciples must have felt that first Easter day. Three days earlier, the one to whom they had devoted their lives for the past three years had been executed in the most torturous, anguishing manner known to humankind. Rome reserved crucifixion for the worst offenders, insurrectionists and traitors, those who threatened the empire. The promises of the reign of God must have seen further away than ever for the disciples, when instead of leading a rebellion, Jesus does not even resist when the authorities come to arrest him. In the midst of their grief and mourning, they hear from Peter and the unidentified beloved disciple that the tomb was empty, and later Mary Magdalene told them that she had seen and spoken to the Lord. What in the world was going on? Was Mary just overwrought with grief? To add to their emotional distress, they were also in fear of the authorities. Now that Jesus had been executed, wasn't it likely that the authorities would come after them as Jesus' accomplices? Were their lives soon to end like his? And what if what Mary said was true? Wouldn't Jesus be angry with them for deserting him and with Peter for denying him? Only the women and the beloved disciple had stayed by the cross that horrible heart. No wonder the disciples are in a locked room, locked in fear, their minds swirling, unable to make sense of it all. Suddenly they see Jesus standing among them and saying, Peace be with you. In other words, don't let your hearts be troubled and heavy any longer. I am with you. But even then, the disciples don't immediately breathe a sigh of relief and rejoice. That doesn't happen until Jesus shows them his scars and confirms for them that he really is the one standing before them, and it's not some trick or of their imagination or a vision. Jesus then commissions them to go out into the world to proclaim the good news that will bring others to faith. And just as God breathed life into Adam, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into the disciples, empowering them and bringing them new life in the resurrection. 
We don't know why Thomas wasn't with the disciples that day. Maybe he just wanted to be alone in his grief. Maybe he thought it would be safer if they weren't all clustered together when the authorities came looking for them. Or maybe he felt that Jesus' death was the final act of the last three years, and he now needed to move on. In the other accounts we have of Thomas, he appears to be a realist. You may recall that after hearing that Lazarus had, had died, Jesus was determined to go to Judea to raise him from the dead. The disciples knew this wasn't safe because the last time Jesus had been in Judea, the people tried to stone him. It is Thomas who urges his fellow disciples to accompany Jesus and to die with him, if need be. After the last meal with his disciples, when Jesus tells them he's going to prepare a place for them and that they know the way, Thomas calls him on it and says that they don't know where Jesus is going, so how can they know the way? Yes. Thomas is definitely a realist. When Thomas returns to the group and the disciples tell him that Jesus has appeared to them, Thomas doesn't believe them any more than the disciples believed Mary Magdalene. He demands proof. Perhaps he does this because he just can't bear the thought of his hopes being dashed again. And then Jesus shows up, meeting Thomas where his faith life is at that moment, and providing the proof that Thomas needs. It's unclear from the text whether Thomas touches Jesus' wounds or not, but he makes the greatest confession of anyone in John's entire gospel by proclaiming Jesus, my Lord and my God. No one else has claimed Jesus as God before Thomas did. Messiah, yes. Son of God, yes. But God alone, here Thomas confesses the very heart of the Christian faith, which echoes the opening words of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory. If Thomas had doubts before, he certainly does not have them now. Jesus' next words to Thomas, do you believe because you have seen, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Seem a bit harsh, especially when you consider that all the people who have come to believe in Jesus and John's gospel came to faith through a direct experience with Jesus. They have all seen. Therefore, Bible commentators suggest that instead of this being a rebuke of Thomas, it is a blessing for all who will come to faith without a direct encounter with Jesus. The community for whom John wrote his gospel some 70 years after Jesus' death, and for those of the second century church down to the 21st century church, which includes us. These words are also an affirmation to the disciples that their proclamation <coughs> through the help of the Holy Spirit will be effective and will be passed on down through the ages. As we reflect on the story of Thomas and the disciples and our own lives of faith, we begin to see points of connection. We know from our own experience that a life of faith includes times of doubt, of questioning, of struggling to understand, of accepting that this side of heaven we will often only see dimly or catch glimpses. Our doubts can arise from events in the Bible, in Bible stories or in the, the theological tenets themselves. What do the parables mean, like the one about the wheat and the tares? How did Jesus feed all those people with two fish and five loaves? Is there a way to explain how the resurrection could have happened scientifically? Why do the Gospels sometimes contradict one another? How can we understand the Trinity? How can bread and wine at the same time be the body and blood of Christ? Most of us have also known times when faith is there, but it is not strong and vibrant. When we feel our prayers are being spoken in a vacuum. When scripture does not speak to our hearts. And when bread and wine are just that. And then there are other larger issues that perplex us and often raise more questions than answers. How can I live faithfully in this world of so much brokenness? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Why are so many innocent lives lost through natural disasters, deliberate acts, or accidents? Why doesn't God intervene? Where is God in suffering? 
Why does God at times seem so silent? Why did this happen to me? Why did my loved one die? These issues can deeply shape our faith. Many of us have known the dark night of the soul and perhaps have even questioned why we believe in God at all. We can take some comfort in knowing that exemplars of a life of faith like Martin Luther, John Calvin, C.S. Lewis, Mother Teresa, and most recently Pope Francis admit to times of doubt too. The universal experience of doubt certainly suggests that doubt is not the opposite of faith, but rather an element of it, as the theologian Paul Tillich said. Thomas Burton offers this. We too often forget that Christian faith is a principle of questioning and struggle before it becomes a principle of certitude and peace. Or, as an anonymous Benedictine monk once stated, doubt is merely a seed of faith, a sign that faith is alive and ready to grow. Jesus doesn't berate Thomas for his doubt, but encourages him to believe, which probably did not sound quite the same to first century years as it does to 21st century ones. Poet, author, and spiritual writer Kathleen Norris writes that at its Greek root, to believe simply means to give one's heart to. But the word belief has been impoverished. It has come to mean a head over heart intellectual assent. When people ask, what do you believe? They are usually asking, what do you think? Giving one's heart, too, is a good definition for the way John uses the word belief in his gospel. If you give your heart to something, you are totally committed to it. You give of yourself to it. You make time for it. If you give your heart to someone, you are in relationship with that person. You trust that person. You rely on that person. You love that person. According to John, Jesus invites us to be in loving relationship with him, to abide in his love. Isn't it out of love for us that Jesus came to live among us and to die for us? Isn't that why we are empowered by the gift of the Holy Spirit to be the voice, hands, feet, and heart of Christ in the world so that we can invite others into a relationship with God? Certainly John's images of Jesus as the good shepherd and we as sheep Jesus is the vine, and we as branches speaks to this intimate relationship that God desires with us. As a flock of sheep, or as branches of the vine, we are also in relationship with one another. We are in community, a community of faith with Christ at the head. As both the writer of Acts and 1 John describe it, it is a close-knit community of mutual care and concern, not only for physical needs, but also for spiritual ones. And we need this community for our growth in faith, because here is where we can express our doubts. We don't have to figure it all out for ourselves. Through worship and prayer, mutual study and conversation about our experiences, observations, and thoughts, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can discern and gain a greater understanding of the issues that perplex us. As we engage in this work together, we fuel the flame of faith for one another. We grow in discipleship, in our relationship with one another, and in our relationship with God. All this adds to the joy of living the life that Christ has called us to live. I'm not saying we will have great epiphanies and all our doubts and struggles to understand will vanish. Sometimes it's a gradual acceptance of those things we do not fully comprehend because it is part of something greater that we believe in. God's great love for us. Understanding is ongoing and usually comes in increments as Jesus comes to us and nurtures our growth in faith. As a community of people who are simultaneously believers and doubters works together to serve others in Jesus' name, we affirm our conviction that our faith depends foremost not on what we can get our hearts and heads around, but on the Christ who continues to come to us amid our doubts drawing us into new life for the sake of the world. Easter is not over. It never will be. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah.